Welcome, Mr. Steve Mears, former NHL Network host of NHL Live, play-by-play -play announcer at AT&T Sports for the Pittsburgh Penguins. How are you doing, Mr. Mears? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Um, so first, since you're a Pittsburgh guy, local guy, um, what is the greatest Lemieux highlight in your personal opinion? Well, there are so many of them. And, and uh, when I was younger, he was my idol. He's the reason I got interested in the sport. I was a part of that whole generation that got into hockey really because of him and that Penguins team that won in 1991 and then repeated in 1992. So uh, I could go on and on. We don't even have the time. I could be, we could turn this into a five hour episode at least if I went through all my favorite Mario moments and my as a fan are only post 91, not to mention all the great moments of the eighties, which I would see later on tape. But uh, I became a fan with the first cup in 1991. So all of my direct memories of that point, and there are so many of them, uh, most notably the, the cup wins, but the comeback and it's just all a part of the lore of one of the great athletes of all time. But for me, the signature moment and, and, and really the signature moment in penguin history, I think, is the first game of the 1992 Stanley Cup final, Penguins and Blackhawks. Penguins have a miraculous comeback, and Mario wins it with a game-winning goal in the final seconds of the third period. And right then you knew that series was over, and the Penguins were going to repeat. They weren't going to lose. They didn't lose a game for two series plus in that playoff run. And he scores on the rebound on Eddie Belfour. Mike Lang gives the iconic, iconic call, which is uh, he's told me is his, his favorite call of all time. And uh, I just think that was the, the most memorable moment that got me hooked on hockey. And, and uh, but yeah, as I said, you could go on and on with some of the goals where he scored, you know, the Minnesota goal split in the defense. Uh, I was at the Igloo for what we thought was his final goal in uh, the playoff series against Philadelphia Flyers in 1997. Little did we know there would be a comeback, but still it didn't diminish that moment. And I mean, just to score in his final shift uh, in Pittsburgh, so we thought. And then the comeback and, and so many other great moments. So we could go on and on, but uh, for me, it will always be 1992 in game one against the Blackhawks. Um, going off the Lemieux question. How do you think the core of the Penguins dynasty compares to like the core of like the other great dynasties, you know, like Edmonton or the Islanders or like the Penguins in the 90s? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's it's right up there. I mean, to, in order to compare, you, it's really difficult because not only are they different eras, but those teams were in a completely different hockey ecosystem and they, like in the case of the Islanders, they won 19 straight playoff series. They won four straight Stanley Cups, and nobody has done that since. So uh, I think the Islanders are probably the greatest dynasty, uh, and that's with all due respect to the Oilers and the, the Canadians of the 50s and the Canadians of the 70s. Uh, but to win that many straight playoff series and then to get to another final in the fifth straight year and lose and kind of pass the torch on to the Oilers with, uh, with Wayne Gretzky, I just think that's never going to be matched to win 19 straight playoff series like the Islanders. Uh, but this core for a modern era in a salary cap world, let's not forget about that. It's harder to keep those teams intact uh, in this day and age. And it's absolutely near miraculous that the Penguins have been able to do that, to keep at the moment three guys staying together for this long. I mean, it's almost unprecedented in all of sports. You think about like the New York Yankees and their core four players, Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera and so forth. Uh, it, it's rare in, in sports and especially in a salary cap national hockey league to keep Crosby and Malkin and Latang together and even flurry for as long as they did. It's unheard of. So they've had a lot of success. I think for a modern era, this core is right up what they've accomplished with three Stanley cups going back to back, which hadn't happened in 20 years. Um, that, 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 I think, in a salary cap era to win back to back cups like the Lightning have done and now the Penguins have done, I think it's, it's remarkable. So it's right up there, but it's so difficult to compare the different eras. I mean, the 80s were high flying and high scoring and, and the goaltending equipment wasn't what it is nearly now. Um, the the goaltending position wasn't the same. The training wasn't the same. And the league was smaller and, and uh, the game was just different. So it, it's so tough to compare. But when you start to factor in 
things like the salary cap and the modern parity in the NHL, I think you could absolutely, when grading on a scale, you could put the Penguins run and their core up against any in NHL history. Um, so do you feel that like a fourth cup for this Penguins core would put them up there with one of the greatest dynasties in the NHL? Yeah, well, I mean, it'd be four, it'd be three cups since 2016. Let's say if they win it this year. So that, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and, and it will still be, again, if say they went, were to win this year, it will still be the core of Crosby, Malkin, and Latang. And it all starts with them. And they are the backbone of this current team. So, so yeah, uh, as I said, when you, if you grade it to scale, then it's right up there with the other great teams and eras in NHL history, but it's just so hard to compare. I mean, even the nineties penguins, it was a lot different and that team probably should have won three straight um, way before you were born. Heartbreaking loss, the most uh, heartbreaking, probably I was about the same age that you are now. And it was devastating when the 93 penguins lost because there was no way they were going to lose to the New York Islanders, but game seven goes to overtime. Anything can happen. And just one of the most heartbreaking, really the most heartbreaking loss in penguin history. And they lost the 93, but, um, yeah, it's uh, when you when you consider, I think when you, you have to consider the salary cap and you have to consider the fact that there are no bad teams now in the NHL. There are no easy nights. Back in the 90s, Mario, Yager, they would go to, let's say, expansion San Jose or expansion Ottawa. And those guys would be guaranteed four points. And then the question was, how many more would they get after that? And now you go, let's say it's a game between the Penguins and Arizona Coyotes or at the bottom of the standings in the NHL here this year. It's, it's hard for Sidney Crosby. To, he's got to scratch away and claw just to get a point or two. And some nights he'll have a big night. We know that. But there are no easy nights anymore. And that's because of salary cap and the parity, the way the league has been designed. And they want that. They want all the teams to be relatively competitive. So uh, I think it's good for the game. If you don't want to have that huge disparity where you have the elite teams and then you have about five or six that have absolutely no chance for year after year. And that's unfortunately where the Penguins were for a long time. And now the scales have been evened out a little bit around the league. So I, I think it's a good thing. But uh, that's one factor is that there are no easy nights. And to go through this grind of a schedule where every game is difficult, even against the worst team in today's hell, it's a hard fought two points. And I think that's one of the big differences. As a play-by-play -play announcer, what do you feel is the best game that you've called? Oh, well, I've been lucky enough to do a bunch of games. I mean, we don't do the Penguin playoff games when they go far beyond the first round. We only have the first round as the local rights holders. So uh, I haven't had the chance to call some of the big uh, Penguin runs, but I did get to do those broadcasts for NHL International. So I got to call both Stanley Cup wins in 2016 and 2017 on the international side when I was working with NHL Network. And uh, I think my favorite game and, and maybe the most memorable for me was uh, the 2017 World Juniors. It was Team USA against Team Canada. It was prime time. I think it's still the most watched thing ever on NHL Network. And it was in Montreal at the Bell Center, which is my favorite arena to broadcast a game in. And uh, it was it had all the elements that you could ever want it was in prime time it was u.s canada so you had a rivalry it had all the twists and turns and the drama that you want in a great sporting event it had overtime it had a shootout it had a power play in overtime it had multiple multi-goal lead changes and that, the thing with the world juniors is when you're talking about these young players who are under 20 years of age the momentum swings are so much more pronounced because they're young players and uh, the ebbs and flows of any championship game at the World Juniors are usually very pronounced. And, uh, and that was no exception. It was just such a cool atmosphere. I was so lucky that I just had a chance to be there, but to call it and get a lot of good feedback afterward that a lot of people watched. And, uh, and the fact that USA won in a shootout in dramatic fashion, and, and uh, they have now become a, a powerhouse on the international hockey stage. And I got to see a lot of the, the great players like Charlie McAvoy and Clayton Keller. And there were so many good players uh, in my time of doing the World Juniors that graduated on to the NHL. And I got to see at a really young age and even going back further, Johnny Gaudreau and JT Miller and John Gibson, uh, so many Seth Jones. 
it, it was it was always really cool to do those world junior tournaments and to see the future of the game and now many of those guys are, are the current superstars in the nhl um who, what player do you feel has improved the most from last season on the pittsburgh penguins Oh, that's a, there are a lot of guys. Uh, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is obviously Tristan Jari from uh, his struggles in the playoffs. He was determined. He was going to put the work in in the offseason. And the Penguins showed faith in him and said, we're not going to go out and get anybody. We believe in you. And he rewarded that faith. He's fantastic. In the first half of the season, he's been one of the best goalies in the NHL. Now, the Tristan Jari story isn't going to be fully completed until he has success in the playoffs. But you can't do that number in January so uh, so far so good he's been one of the best he's in the conversation for the Vezina and uh, I think he's maybe the Penguins MVP so to see that type of improvement from where he was in the playoffs with those struggles to now and the calm and the poise in which he plays uh, it, it's really cool to watch and uh, I'm really happy for him uh, I think it's great that the Penguins showed that level of faith in him. And uh, hey, when you look at a guy like Mark Andre Fleury, he struggled in the playoffs too mightily, and he was the exact same age. And he bounced back incredibly on the way to a Hall of Fame career and more Stanley Cups. So uh, I think he would be up there. But there are a lot of guys. I mean, uh, I think Evan Rodriguez is a perfect example of a guy. He's taken his game to another level. You can make the case Jake Gensel has improved. He was good last year. He's even better this year. Uh, so you could just go on and on with a lot of players um, that uh, Chris Letang had a great year last year, even better this year, and some others as well. So uh, I think Tristan Jari is the first one that comes to mind, but uh, I think you could go down the list. The second one, though, is Evan Rodriguez. I mean, he, he's really having a career year, and, uh, and it's really cool to see for a guy that was undrafted and has paid his dues. He played in the minors. He's kind of bounced back and forth. Even on paper with the Penguins, he's bounced back and forth. They traded him to Toronto and then re-signed him. So uh, I'm really happy for somebody like Evan Rodriguez, who's in the last year of a contract. And it's cool to see somebody just explode and have a career year, and uh, I don't think it could happen to a better guy. Um, what do you feel is the current state of the Penguins right now? I think it's a really good first half of the year. You got to be impressed by the six most points in the league going into the all-star break, the eighth best points percentage, the fourth best team as far as goals against. And that's not a category that the Penguins are usually known for. They're more known for high flying offense. That's the way it's always been in my lifetime. But to be the fourth best defensive team, I mean, that's how you win. That's how you win championships. So that's really important. And I think that's really encouraging. And uh, I think they're still very much a win now team, as evidenced by signing Jeff Carter to a two-year extension. You don't do that unless you think that you're going to continue aiming for the Stanley Cup for at least another couple of years. So I think that's the message that's been delivered by not only the management of the Penguins, but the players themselves. They've earned that. If they had gotten off to a terrible start and if they were just barely in a playoff conversation right now, you'd be having a whole different discussion about what to do with some of the veteran players who have contracts that are expiring, what to do even beyond that. And uh, because of the Penguins' success and the way that they play and the work of Mike Sullivan and the success that they've had him here in this first half of the regular season leading up to the All-Star break, then uh, I think that management has really no choice. They've got to go for it. They realize you've got Sidney Crosby here. He's 34 years of age. You've got a Guinea Malkin who still can produce, as we've seen, at age 35. So I, I absolutely think this team can go far in the playoffs. The biggest question, of course, is always with any team is going to be goaltending. You have to have it. Uh, but that's so far, so good with Tristan Jari, as I said. And uh, I just think the, the Penguins, because of the way they play, they've earned the chance to not only keep it tacked with a lot of guys that have earned the last year of their deals, but uh, maybe to add, if they have the chance to add a piece at the trade deadline, it won't be easy with the salary cap, but maybe they want to add something and go for another run here because I think they're that good. Um, going off your answer, what position do you feel that the Penguins should address like in the trade deadline if need be? Well, like I said, it's not easy because the prices are steep. They always are. And they're up against the salary cap. So they don't have a whole lot of room. It's very difficult when you're a team like the Penguins to make an addition. 
And also they love the chemistry that they have. And there's uh, very few players that you'd want to say, well, that guy's got to go, you know, and even like the backup goalie position was much talked about. Well, now they've got a, one guy who played really well in one game and then got injured in Louis Domingue and Casey DeSmith Smith in his last outing played very well. And that was encouraging. So, uh, and, and any player is going to have slumps or bad starts or well, whatever. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just wonder about really the, the defense. I think most teams, if you have a chance to add a depth defenseman, I think the Penguins would probably want to do that. Uh, I wonder about when you get to the playoffs and you play a heavy brand of hockey and the penalties start to be few and far between, you don't get as many power play chances. And it is a grind of a game and it's hard hitting and it's a lot of five on five and it's a lot of battles and i wonder if the penguins might want to go out and look if it's possible to get a defenseman who can thrive in that type of an environment now every team wants that guy there are some names that are out there every team that's in the playoff conversation wants that type of stay at home f defenseman who can block shots and is physical and just is makes life miserable for the opposing forwards uh but if the penguins can swing a deal like that and get that type of even if he doesn't play every night uh if you get into a playoff series against a heavy team like a washington or like a tampa that uh, you could throw somebody out there that's going to play that brand of hockey yes you need puck movers on the blue line you have to be able to get the puck up to those talented forwards and the penguins have a great puck moving defenseman but i wonder if there's a chance maybe they could add some uh, piece like that where you have like a a uh, heavier defenseman that plays a more stiff brand of defense and and uh, can block shots and can help out the goaltender. Um, how did you get your big break as an announcer and as an aspiring sports broadcaster? What do you feel is a key piece in getting that big break? Well, I always say, and I speak with a lot of students of all different ages, middle school, high school, college, I think. Three things are timing, luck, and talent. And I don't know what the percentages are of each. I don't know what the order of importance is, but timing, luck, and talent. You have to have some amount of timing on your side. And I certainly did. And uh, when I got my big break with the New York Islanders, I was actually going for the job of their AHL affiliate in Bridgeport. And then the Island Club opened up and I was kind of already in the door with their organization. So there's a great example of timing and luck. Uh, So yeah, you have to have luck on your side but you can do a really good job of improving your chances and you can uh, increase your odds and make connections and, and just be professional in everything that you do and be courteous and make sure that you keep in mind all all the people that come along the way and you leave a good impression and all those things. Uh, You can definitely improve your odds and your luck. And then you have to have some degree of talent. I'd like to think if I'm still around, I still have some, level of talent on my going on my side but obviously the islanders saw something in me and they wanted to bring me on when i was 26 and i was very fortunate to get that break it was a good stepping stone it wasn't the place to stay for many years and in hindsight it all it all worked out really well and i got to come to pittsburgh and i got to get to know the penguins organization i got to work with mike lang and now here i am after doing radio for the penguins i did tv and i'm able to do tv here now full time which is an honor um, but there's a lot that goes into it. And it's just, uh, I think making those connections, the networking and just leaving a good impression because the hockey world and the sports world, it's so small and you never want to burn any bridges, you never want to leave the impression that you're in any way unprofessional or you're sloppy or you don't have a uh, good character. Uh, you just basically want to go with the old golden rule, which is treat others the way you want to be treated. And uh, the people that I was around when I first got to the NHL, they were the embodiment of that. And I, I saw it firsthand. I was in New York and I got to see Sam Rosen all the time with the Rangers and Kenny Albert. Doc Emmerich was doing the Devils. And I got to work with Howie Rose and Chris King and Billy Jaffe with the Islanders. And these guys are not only are they unbelievably talented broadcasters, but they're so professional and nice and kind to everyone. And I really learned a lot. Mike Lang, I met him there uh, when we the Islanders would play the Penguins, and he couldn't have been nicer and more friendly and uh, willing to help out a young guy like myself. So when you see them, and they're especially those names that I just mentioned, when you see them acting as the nicest person in the ring, I mean, you have no choice. You better be 
just as nice as they are and just kind and courteous and professional and willing to help out, willing to share information. Anytime we had a game against the Devils, Doc Emmerich would, would pull me aside and uh, we would share notes. And when I say share notes, it would be like he gave me a hundred and I gave him like one on the Islanders. But, and then afterward, he would say, Steve, thank you for your time. And I would say, thank me for my time. You're Doc Emmerich. I'm, I should be sitting here just in awe. And I was and recording every second of it. And uh, but they, it's just the he's the nicest man. And Mike Lang and Sam Rose and all these guys, uh, they really left a big impression on me. And I think that's uh, one lesson that I've tried to pass on to other students is that uh, that's the least that you can do. And that will definitely improve your odds uh, when people look back and they say, oh, I remember him. And he was very classy and, and uh, very professional and did a good job on the air and, and hopefully along the way they remembered my name and uh and i tried to leave a good impression um was it a dream to work for your hometown team as like the play-by-play announcer oh absolutely it is every day i mean every day i walk into that arena and there are banners in the back entrance where the tv trucks are and it's a banner that has all five stanley cups and it says welcome to the home of the pittsburgh penguins i always make it a point to look up to that banner and just remind myself, it's a bad day or if you know, things didn't go perfectly. So, yeah, we all have bad days or uh, clunky broadcasts or who, who knows what else is going on. Everyone has the ebbs and flows of just everyday life. It could be a bad day weather-wise, who knows? Uh, but just to go and look at that banner and just remind myself that, first of all, I'm getting in for free. And that's the greatest thing of the whole job is you get in for free. And if you had told the 13-year-old Steve that you would get a chance to get in to do one game of the Pittsburgh Penguins and you get a chance to do it on television and bring it to the Penguin fans and you would get in for free and you get to call some of the greatest players of all time in the sport that you love, even just one game, I would have been thrilled. Then would have been like, oh, I'm tapping out. See you later. Okay, happy, done. I did it whatever I wanted to. And now the fact that I've been able to do it here for five years, hopefully more, uh, I've probably done maybe 600 NHL games for Stanley Cup finals, a bunch of world juniors like we talked about and outdoor games and so forth. I mean, I'm playing with house money. I'm very, uh, very fortunate. And uh, it's just a blessing every day. And it's not something that happens very often where the you get to announce the games for your hometown team. If you look around the NHL, that's actually very rare. Most of the time, you're just lucky to get any job in professional sports or in the league that you choose in the biggest level of, let's say, the NHL. Uh, I was with the Islanders and I didn't think I would, uh, uh, I would ever be calling games for the New York Islanders in, in New York, but that's where the job was. So I took that opening and, uh, and it was fantastic, but it's really special because the, the Penguins and, and the love of the sport that's in my DNA. I don't apologize for being a homer. I, I'm from here. If that's not going to change. That's who I am. It's my beloved team, my favorite team of my entire life. And I have a pretty good grasp on the history of the team because of that. I think that helps in the broadcast. And I'd like to think that uh, that comes through over the airwaves, just the passion and the love for not only the team, but the city itself, because I'm from here and from Murraysville. So, um, and I love the Pirates and I love the Steelers almost as much, but the Penguins are always number one for me. And uh, it's just, uh, it's just such a blessing every day. And, and uh, I never take it for granted. And, and at the very least, I try to, pass along a lot, a lot of these little uh, nuggets, pearls of wisdom that the, the greats like Mike Lang and Doc Emmerich have passed on to me. I try to share them with everybody else and all the students that I talk to. It's been an honor, Mr. Mears. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Keep up the good work. Thank you.